Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is uh, Stephen Spector. With me is Rob Hirschfeld, of course. Hey, hey, Rob. And we have the security man himself, Christopher Steffen, who is the tech director at uh, CryptZone. And Chris and I worked together in the past. And, and when it comes to security, cloud security, anything security, I call Chris first and foremost because I don't know of anyone who knows it better than him. So, Chris, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for the invite and looking forward to, to chatting with you guys. So, so Chris, I'll, I'll start off with a really simple open-ended question that can go for a couple hours and then we'll go from there. But uh, if we talk about cloud, what's the state of security today? Are people comfortable? Are people nervous? I, I don't hear about it much, but I know something's got to be going on. Yeah. And, and the reality is, is all kinds of stuff is going on, right? Um, the so uh, let, let me start by just basically saying that the, um, if you would have asked me two, three, four years ago, was moving your workloads up into the cloud a secure methodology and, and something that you could realistically take and secure and, and, and pass with an audit and pass with your compliance, I would have said, mm, maybe, but probably not. Um, those days are over. Uh, the, the cloud today is, uh, public cloud is, is infinitely more secure than most of your on-premise environments are going to be. And, and the very simple proof, and it's not, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than this, is that um, the, the major cloud providers out there, be it Amazon or Google or, or uh, Azure, they're spending billions, billions with a B, every year on improving security and compliance in their environments. Um, no matter how you look at it, your on-premise environment cannot compete with the amount of manpower and resources that they are taking and putting towards improving their security. So when most companies take a look at a hybrid cloud model, which is the one that of course most people would be using, um, it, it makes all the sense in the world to start looking at a uh, migration path that you can take and put those highly secured, highly compliant workloads up into the cloud because of the security that the cloud has to offer and then figure out a way to methodically and reasonably transition the remainder of your workloads to a cloud. Again, this is something that, that <laughs> has, been, has been going on for a while, but the reality of it is, is that it is something that um, I fundamentally believe is, is really rapidly changing. And so heading to AWS uh, in the short near future here, and you'd be amazed how many security vendors there are at that, that conference. So obviously cloud is a thing, um, security in the cloud is a thing. So I, I, I agree with what I agree with you fundamentally. I, I, I do think that the enemy of security is complexity. Uh, and it's very easy to trip a setting wrong in any on premises or cloud infrastructure and, and expose data to the world that you didn't realize was exposed. Um, I, I mean, it, at least, and I, I'm, I'm going to. I agree with your statement, but I, I want to play the contrarian for a moment. Um, at least with a, a, you know an on-premises infrastructure, you you had this illusion of a of a tight perimeter. You know, people weren't just automatically walking in and, and jumping right into your data the way somebody who misconfigured an S3 bucket would you know would get. Where how do you find how do you counsel people in this balance? And you know what, that you're you're, you're right uh, in so much as that. Um, there is an illusion that your, your on-premise environment was secure to begin with. And again, there, there may have been a point where there was a, a modicum of truth to that, but I, I would argue that those days are really kind of, you know, kind of old school. Just, just like, for example, I, I mean, taking it and, 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 and claiming that your, um, you know that you you have this ultimate security because you have a uh, encrypted VPN to get into your network. Well, th that's security writ large. And when I think about network security, I should think about VPNs. Well, as as you well know, that's just really not the truth, right? I think there's a misnomer that people believe that uh, an encrypted VPN equals security, but the reality is, is a VPN was nothing more than a a connectivity tool. And and kudos that we took and put encryption with it. But the reality of it is, is that it isn't any more secure than, and, and, and thank goodness that you have, you know, some encryption attached to your VPN. But, you know, thinking that as a wholesale 
you know, security solution for network connectivity, but that doesn't make any sense either. So no. I guess I guess what I would say in, in that regard is that when you take a look at um, the, the environments that we're kind of talking about, and I'm not talking, but you, you can take and look at any size that you want here. But when you start taking and talking about um, the, the biggest workloads that you can imagine with the biggest customer, so on and so forth, um, and, and I'm not going to disagree with you. There's always a chance to have some kind of misconfiguration, so on and so forth. But um, th that aside, the, just the, the, the base infrastructure for a small to medium sized business to take and jump into a uh, hybrid cloud situation, a public cloud situation is so much better from an a, a overall security standpoint, a security strategy than it was previously, and then arguably more secure than whatever environment they were going to stand up on their own, given, you know, unless they have, again, some crazy amount of security related resources that, you know, they really can't afford to have as a small to medium sized business. Right. I, and I think that's a fair bet, right? The, 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 the amount of the stack that you have to build and secure is tiny. So somebody saying, oh, you can misconfigure your S3 buckets and cause, you know, dissemination of data. That's entirely true. The, the, the difference is you only had the S3. You didn't have to worry about all of the pieces below the API for S3. Uh, and, you know, the security, you know, everything that goes around it. Yeah, um, and I, I'm certainly not going to disagree with that. And, and you also yeah. mentioned that complexity is the root of all evil. And I I couldn't agree with you more, right? I mean, in, in any ideal situation from a security perspective, you are trying to decrease the level of complexity that you have in your environment, not increase. So taking and throwing on a separate set of, you know, public cloud related controls arguably would not be advantageous to trying to decrease your overall security. But what I guess I would argue in that case is when you take and are looking at those controls anyway, if they're created correctly, they should just cross apply over to whatever public cloud environment you're going to. And if they don't, then you really ought to be reevaluating what those controls are and why they aren't directly cross applying to whatever, uh, you know, external environment that you're looking at. That's the kind of evaluation that you should be doing. And, and we get we get back to the other the other major security vulnerability is people and manual oh. configuration and steps and things like that and, and so you know, those are these are and they're not unique to public cloud at all although I think public cloud has better APIs so that you can run the uh, you can you can automate your your security process and your configuration process in ways that that help prevent somebody leaving a back door open. Uh, because they needed to, you know, fix something on the weekend, or they, they you know, they were going to work from home, and you didn't give them access normally. Something silly like that. Yeah, I mean, ideally, we would eliminate all the people, and then um, it, it would take and make our environments way more secure. Right? <laughs> and I mean, that, that's that's said as a true security security guy at heart, right? I mean, I can make the, the greatest security system in the world if I can make it so that nobody has to see it, right? Uh, um, and, and so I and I, I could I obviously am being facetious. I, I couldn't agree yeah. with you more though. I mean, the 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 inherent problem that you have is with computers and security in general is people, right? And so um, and anything that you can do to try to uh, mitigate the the people aspect of security is always good. And you can do that with some automation. You can do that with you know, some of the tools that exist today, but you're, you're always going to be right. The, it, it doesn't matter how great your tools are. It doesn't matter how great, you know, your systems are. Um, you know, the, 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 you, you, the, the joke is always about the foolproof system, right? You, you yeah. come up with something foolproof and then you develop a better fool, right? And so, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, but it, it's absolutely the truth, you know? And this is, this is where there was a, a rant cast we did, uh, a, a couple of episodes, actually, I think over a dozen episodes ago at this point. It's been a while. But lesson to managers. If you want your people to not expose security value validations, give them time and training to fix these problems. The, a lot of what we're talking about happens not because people are dumb, they're not, or because they're willfully doing this, they're not. We're doing it because we're overloading them with work and they take shortcuts, 
or don't pay down technical debt when they should. These are preventable problems if management creates the space for the people they employ to fix them. Anyway, sorry. Soapbox, putting the soapbox down. <laughs> yeah, but, but everything that you said is 100% true, right? So, and, and the, it, it's actually compounded when you start talking about your, your, your public cloud infrastructure because you have all this rogue IT and, and so on and so forth. Yes. And so now you have an inherent barrier to get in the way of your, let's say that you have an agile development infrastructure and you, know, you, you have to go through 47 hoops to get a provision box and whatever on-premise environment you have. Well, I, I just need a credit card in five minutes time and I am completely up running and uh, in production in an Azure or an AWS environment and you, know, you blinked and it's done. And now, now Rogue IT lives in my small to medium sized business. Now I have to deal with that as well. And so putting up those roadblocks without taking and putting up reasonable solutions on how to deal with those roadblocks is always going to be a problem. The, the, the key is finding tools that help mitigate some of those roadblocks and make it relatively easy. And it, it's interesting because I just was having this conversation not three hours ago with, with one of the sales engineers that I really, really respect. And this was the conversation that we were having because the, one of the, the inherent barriers to taking and moving into a cloud environment is the lack of it's, it's either the lack of controls and you, you freak out all your compliance side people, or it is so many controls that your DevOps people saying, why bother kind of thing. So right. it, there, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. And the key is trying to discover that and deploy that in a way that almost makes everybody happy. And you're going to, you're going to bounce back and forth. You're going to, you're going to, and the, the thing is to make decisions that don't, lock you into being too one way or the other. Um, I agree. And that's that people. So, so I want to, so th there was a topic we talked about in, in, in prep that I, I want to get to, but it's going to be three, I got, we got to walk three steps, which I, I want to talk about hardware security because, because that's the type of geek I am. Sure. But, so uh, six Terra is a data center company doing specializing in secure infrastructure. We spent all this time sounding like we're huge AWS fanboys. How, how, pull me back. What, why, <laughs> why, why, why does a customer, uh, why, how do you get a customer to not just jump in with both feet into Amazon and, and shut off everything else? Yeah, I, and that's a really great question. And, and the reality of it is, is that it, it, it is that weird fine line. Um, the, so a, a little bit on Sixera, and I'm not trying to sound like a, a sales pitch here, but we, we are more than just data centers. We are actually started out as um, a company. It started out in, in May of this last year. Um, it's a, the, the, um, it basically the combination of all of the old Savas CenturyLink data centers, but then um, the, the founder, a gentleman by the name of Manny Medina, basically decided that we would also take and concentrate uh, almost exclusively on secure security and secure infrastructure. And to that end, um, as part of the whole deal, he um, assisted in the purchase of um, four different uh, pretty big name security companies. Um, the first one where I came from was a company called uh, Cryptzone. Uh, Cryptzone provides a software defined perimeter infrastructure network security solution. Uh, we can talk about that ad nauseum, obviously. Um, <laughs> the, the other three are a company called Brainspace, uh, Easy Solutions, and uh, a company called Catbird uh, does visualizations in east-west traffic. Uh, anyway, lo long story short, um, security has always been at the heart of the, the our company, the six-star company. So you think of it as two pieces if you want, but it really acts as one. We want to take and provide that security infrastructure that has the ability to address all those concerns, not only in the data center, but in, in the real world, real world as well. The better answer to your question is, is that as a security company and, and as a um, data center co colo company, um, we obviously don't have products that necessarily mesh 100%. But the reality of it there is even that we want to be able to demonstrate that security isn't just a colo thing. It isn't just a software thing. And so even in the colo space, we're not insane, right? Everybody is going to be embracing cloud to a degree, and and you should. I mean, there's a lot of advantages of taking advantage of the things that are that are offered in the cloud. 
but we also fully recognize that there's going to be an on-premise workload that you're going to want to keep there. And so when you are taking and looking at that on-premise workload or that, that hosted workload, like in, in a six terabyte data center, we want that workload to be as secure as humanly possible. Right. I mean, and then integrated into the cloud in a secure way. I, That's I agree with yeah. you. So, I mean, this, what, what you're describing is the dreaded hybrid, um, which is just what most people call, modern IT. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> and, and the, 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 and I think, you know, we're all, you know, we acknowledge on premises does not mean it's at the corporate location. There is no such thing as a corporate location anymore. It, it just means that it's, you own, the, your customer has, has jurisdiction over the whole gear, right? I mean, that's all, that's what on premises means today. It does. Yes. I would agree You're, with that. It's your box. Um, yep. is, is that new? Hold on a second. That I'm not so. Sh <laughs> that was quite a statement. Do you think people <laughs> see it that way? I, I think most people, when you say on premise, they think it's in their data center, hosted, they control. Yeah, but I, I think that's an illusion. I think that it's. I think it's been this way for years, and the idea that there's actually a rack somewhere hiding in the in the basement of your data center is uh, is a legacy. Um, and maybe Chris, Chris, do you do you do you Whoa. see companies still? I, you know, I, I think I, you know, coming from the the background that I have, I, I've always viewed on premise on premises as being something you know that that my CEO can go physically touch and feel better about himself at night. You, you're, you're literally talking about something, and 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 auditors are especially weird about this when when they think on premise, they literally want to physically touch the machine that the data is on. I, and, and I've had them do this, right? And not that not that it even marginally matters. It could be my, you know, the, the latest oh. box that I'm taking and running, you know, a, a Minecraft server or something out of. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, but they want to touch the box, right? Um, I believe what Rob is saying is relatively true. I think that more and more uh, on-premises really is shifting towards uh, the thought of having the ability to control that box from soup to nuts um, and, and everything that's on it, the ownership, so on and so forth. Right. And I think that's where it's shifting. I don't think, to, to Stephen's point, I don't think that's where it used to be. I think that's where it's shifting to. If from a security standpoint, the idea that I feel more secure because I can walk down into my into the data center and you know lay my lay my hands on a server does not improve the security posture of those servers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say just the opposite. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, we do need to think through these problems and, and how we're accessing the data. It's one of the things that makes the cloud more secure is that you can't go in and touch Amazon servers um, at all, right? And, and yeah. there's, and, there's and, really and, no reason to. No, and, and that's that's always been what I believe too. I, I mean, even in the great big data center that I used to manage, you know, the idea that somebody needed to go into the room to do something, whatever that something might be, uh, and, and and sometimes w without exaggeration, literally go in there and touch a box, that was always lunacy to me. That that it never made any sense. If you cannot get to it in a um, a more controlled manner externally, of, uh, apart from taking and literally walking in and touching a keyboard and monitor that happened to be in, you know, on a crash cart in that data center. Well, then again, you're, you're speaking to a larger problem, to be completely honest with you. But um, that said, there are still, you know, folks out there, and and you know, all, all the joking aside, there are um, th there are non what I would call not as educated um, technology types that truly believe that the only way for them to uh, feel comfortable, have that level of comfort that they need to have in order to sleep well at night is to know that that server, that server farm, um, those compute resources are located in a nice, tidy, clean little room sitting in, you know, the second floor of their office space that, you know, only, and arguably the other one that always cracks me up is that in your super secure room, the CEO still has access to that room, which is hilarious on a whole bunch of different ways. But, but aren't um, those but, guys or gals, they're in trouble. That's the way they think. It, but, but it is, but it, it doesn't matter because it, that there are people that literally believe that. 
so, so that this gets to one of my, my favorite topics uh, and the one I wanted to get to, which is let's just secure the hardware, right? If, if those machines, you know, how do, how do we actually take a, a server that's in a vulnerable location and engage the encryption technology that's already built into most of these boxes? Why, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we encrypting the hard drive so that, you know, the CEO can't take them home on the weekend and, and read the data? Um, this is a silly idea, but, 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 you know, for how, you know, how do we, we could actually make the physical infrastructure cryptographically secure. Why don't we? What's happening? And, yeah. And I, I don't really have a good answer to that question because it's something that I've wondered about for a long time too. If you have access to all these tools and let me, let me preface this by saying that once upon a time, there was a uh, unacceptable overhead for, some of those kind of activities on a particular server, I would argue that, that that's no longer the case, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the idea that you would not take advantage of a, for, for, for all intents and purposes, what ends up being a very, very, um, very cost advantageous example of a security way, a secure way to encrypt data on the machine level, I've never understood that. It was, it's something that makes all the sense in the world. And the, 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 the fact is that the fact that people are not doing it more doesn't make any sense to me either. So what, what we're talking about and what I don't understand is why people have you know, encrypted technologies. We have trusted platform module TPM. We have signing certificates. We have all this embedded hardware, right? It's actually on most of the machines that you get, but people don't turn it on. Um, and I mean, we do, you know, Rackend does physical infrastructure automation. So we know that people don't turn it on. <laughs> um, and we also know that it's hard, right? And, and mistakes in setting up the system result in broken, bricked, un inaccessible systems. Um, so I, I think that the, the risk for an operations team to engage this type of platform is high, which is why they don't do it. Um, and then they just, I guess, hope that the, you know, nobody walks into the data center with a, with a key and then, you know, puts themselves on the network or takes data or logs into systems. I... Well, yeah, and I, I, I guess I don't understand that either because security by its very nature, unfortunately, is hard. In fact, for example, one of the, one of the things that I take and talk about quite often is that when you're taking and looking at a, a tool like the, some of the ones that we sell, and, and one of the complaints that we, we get from time to time is that the installation process and the setup process, you know, is, is it takes longer than it takes to, you know, do an install of Microsoft Word. And, and it, you know, the reality of it is, is that, well, you kind of want it to, don't you? I mean, when you're talking about, you know, a, a very simple application and, and something that, you know, is, is, is low, uh, emphasis, low priority, what have you, maybe taking and doing a, a 30 second install is the way to go. And that's what you want. When you're talking about the keys to your kingdom, when you're talking about securing your, the, the, the entirety of your network, isn't that something that you want to kind of think through? Isn't that something you want to, you, you want to be a little thoughtful about and want to take and go through and make certain that you're doing it right. And, and I, I guess I would argue that hardware security is the same way. It's, it's something that you know, when you do it correctly, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of threat. I think that the problem is, is that IT professionals today are in such a rush to get everything provisioned and done and so on and so forth, that the, the luxury, if you want to call it that, of people taking and spending time securing, taking cycles to secure something um, from a hardware perspective in that way is cycles that, and a luxury that they just don't have or they choose not to have or what have you. Well, and this to me is one of the, the, the dilemmas that, that I see is as we build technology is that it, you know, we really are in a place where if you can't get something running in an hour in, you know, not even an hour, in 10 minutes, um, you know, it's very hard to get somebody to evaluate your technology, which means, you know, it's sort of reducing friction, eliminating, um, eliminating security. And eliminating is the wrong word. Disabling, maybe. Um, so, yeah, we get we get into this, this weird step. I would love to see uh, the hardware side of it automatic, right? I think that for what you're what you're building from for a business, 
and what we're building for business, if there was a way to say these servers have these latent physical, you know, security capabilities, we just turn them on, they operate by default, or you, you know, it, there's no, you know, there's no additional, uh, learn, you know, the learning curve has been minimized on, on adding physical security, then I would hope we'd, we'd see people turning it on. Yeah, well, and I guess I would argue too that um, I, I personally believe that in the next two to four years, you're going to see um, security and specifically data security play much greater role in the overall uh, security landscape than it does today. And the reason that I believe that is um, if you are a subscriber to all things weird and uh, compliance related, um, everybody knows that here in the next few months, um, we as security professionals are all going to be um, beating ourselves to death over GDPR and what's going on in Europe. And, and I'm not, that isn't a complaint. It really isn't. I, I personally think that there's a lot of parts of the GDPR that make all the sense in the world. If you are a small to me, medium sized business um, and you're not scared yet about GDPR, you really need to start thinking about what's going on because as, as pervasive as the requirements are going to be and as global as our retail universe is, um, very, very likely that no matter what the size of your business is, it will have uh, be directly impacted by the covenants that are the GDPR. And so one of the things that I've been paying a lot of attention to over the last few months is what are those requirements? What can people do to address those requirements? And, and really, you know, what is that impact going to be? Um, wow. Strangely enough, the, the leaders in this are Google and Facebook. Um, and, and Chris? Sorry, yeah. could you just say what that means? I'm not sure. <laughs> I was, I, I was I gonna apologize. go there next. I GDPR. always ask the questions that no one wants to ask. Can you just tell me what that stands for? Uh, GDPR? Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, the GDPR is the General Data Protective Protection Direct or uh, Regulation. Sorry, a General okay. Data Protection Regulation. Um, and it's, Euro European European standard about data data security and privacy. That's the correct. European yes. Union. It's, it's, yeah. it's written like it's written like a fairy. It, no, somebody was describing it as written like a series of bedtime stories and blog posts. But okay. it is it, you bedtime know what, in that it makes you go to sleep. It, it's an interesting <laughs> way of, of saying it. So um, it, it's a, a series of ninety nine articles that you know. Th think of it as like different articles of a legal document. It's ninety nine articles and. Um, Oh, when it's all said and done, really, the one that really is applicable to the most people, most importantly, at least the one that I'm paying attention to is Article 32, which talks about, you know, exactly what the requirements are for protection. The other ones all talk about how the GDPR standards body is established and the fact that most companies are going to be required to have a data, a data protection officer and our data privacy officer and, and, and what some of the fines will end up being and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of commentary out there about it, um, and again, I, I, I am not a lawyer. I don't even pretend to play one on TV, but uh, everybody should at least have a base understanding of, you know, what those requirements are going to mean to them. The, 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 and the best, the best start place always is going to be um, to do a, a real inventory of what your information security looks like at, at this moment. What does it really mean? What is your data privacy look like? What if, if I asked you as a company to share with me all the information that you have on Chris Stefan, can you do it? And can you do it in a, in a way, not only that you're certain that I'm seeing everything, but you're doing it in a way that I will actually have that answer, um, you know, sometime in the next thousand years or so. And, and so it, that, you know, all those requirements actually pose a lot of problems if you don't know exactly what your security status is, if you don't know how you're controlling your data and uh, what you want to do and what you're going to do if you are given one of those kind of requests to present um, that you have either deleted or can demonstrate that you have no data on a particular European individual. Yeah, that's a huge, it's a huge amount of, it's important and I think it's a good thing. And they, some of that, some of the GDPR just defines what a person is. And oh, very much so. Yeah. Things like that. It's, 
it's remarkable. Um, I blogged yeah. about it. I blogged about it a number of times. I, I'm going to blog about it here again shortly because it's one of those things where every time that I think that I'm done talking about GDPR and Privacy Shield and Safe Harbor, which are all the the U.S. based requirements to address GDPR and that kind of stuff, before as soon as I think that I'm done talking about it, it something either changes. There's a new regulation, um, and 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 our customers and people in general are are really interested in what it means to them. Um, I, you know, it's, it's better to be thinking about it now than to get a, uh, finding or a summons finding out that, you know, you did not address this and then get a huge fine because the fines, you know, a lot of these fines you, you hear about, you know, with, when you violate a, um, some kind of computer standard or so on and so forth, it, you know, mm-hmm. honestly, it's a slap on the wrist and you move on and you remediate and you're done. The fines for GDPR are just massive. It's like four percent of your gross annual uh, revenue, and you know, and it, it's just it's the gift that keeps on giving. Besides, I mean, it, wow. it the fines can be very, very draconian when it's all said and done. Right, and 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 Europe already has data locality protections um, and things. I mean, it's we're we're in a place where we're really struggling with how data and privacy. And it, it, ownership of data, um, you know, we we don't. This hasn't been worked out. It's, it's no, it's not even close. And the the, the yeah. biggest fundamental problem, and I'll get off my soapbox, but the biggest, <laughs> I love it. The, the biggest fundamental problem is is that we we U.S. United States have diametrically opposed views to what should be considered private compared to what uh, our friends in Europe believe. And I, I mean, it, it literally is night and day different. I'll give you an a, a extremely simple example. Um, if somebody wants my email address, all they have to do is ask. And I'm happy to tell them it is plastered all over the internet in a gazillion different places. I, you, everybody's welcome to it. I mean, I, I chat and live by email. So of course I want people to be able to contact me. Right. In the European sense, that is private information that you should not be sharing with anybody. And when you do, you you should be given a notification that that piece of information has been shared. And so very differing views, fundamentally differing views on what should be secured, what shouldn't, what should be shared, what shouldn't, and taking and making those things mesh is going to be a very, very difficult thing to do. It, it's something that, that our, our um, governments have been working together on to try to figure out how those things are addressed for a long time and really are, are not, really have not made all that much in a way of success of getting there. No, and, and things like Equifax, um, where some, a lot of very personal information for US citizens are basically commercial property is not, it, I, I think we're, there's, there's a, a sea change coming. Uh, GDPR is probably a big, you know, a big part of that. The US has got a, make some hard decisions. Um, yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more. And like I said, it, I, it, back to my original point, I, I think over the next couple of years, two, three, four years, you're going to see uh, on a national level in the United States, but on a global level, I think you're going to see some pretty significant wholesale changes in how we approach um, data, data privacy, data encryption, so on and so forth, for the very simple reason that it, it's going to get to a point where it is just easier for a company to almost unilaterally deal with it and spend the money up front taking and um, dealing with data protection than potentially suffer a fine because the fines are so harsh that it just isn't worth the the deal. And so maybe maybe that's the the avenue to take and help us take and get to that next spot. But um, regardless, I think that we're going to see some wholesale changes. So, so I, I'm going to take us to a completely different topic. Um, awesome. The, the, so one of the things that, that we on The Lady Shiny talk about quite a bit is edge infrastructure, which you and I have very different meanings for what edge is. Um, <laughs> um, it, and and I, I don't mean uh, network perimeter or boundary when, when we're talking about edge and, uh, and operating at the edge, uh, we're, we're talking about infrastructure that's been placed in, in a distributed environment. So um, not, you know, not colo on premises, 
but actually, you know, cell tower, um, metro embedded, you know, that, that type of, of very distributed data center. Somebody who is in the, the data center infrastructure business, this has got to give you fits, right? You're worried about, you know, securing a limited number of sites. We're talking about, you know, 100x what those things look like. What, what's your thoughts? Um, and I know this isn't your specialty area, but but it's it's one we love to bring in because it's it's something that that I think listeners are starting to expect from us. What's the security posture for that? Um, what you know? What are your thoughts um, in that environment? Yeah, and and boy, I I wish I had a better answer for you. And the reality of it is, is that it's one of those things that I think is constantly evolving. It's something that you know it, it doesn't matter what your security specialty is. You got to take and, and pay attention to some of the, you know, up and coming trends and how you deal with, you know, edge computing and, and how, you know, how, how it is consumed. And, uh, mm-hmm. but, but like I said, that, that is not even marginally my expertise, but it's something that I think that we all have to pay attention to, to at least some degree or another, because it's, it's part of all, it, it will be part of all of our technology at some point. Yeah, it strikes, it strikes me thinking about the GDPR and the edge is that we're going to have some incredibly sensitive data um, at, in these very distributed locations where there, there isn't a lot of perimeter security, um, physical perimeter security, actually. Um, right? Somebody could walk in and steal a box and, and all of a sudden have, you know, all sorts of data from the people in the mall, you know, doing facial recognition in the mall and identities and credit card transactions and things like that. Um, we could have a lot of vulnerability points there. Well, yeah, and 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 more to the point that the the edge that I choose to, you know, how I choose to define the edge is that that whole idea that you have this this you know basically protected perimeter that used to be, and that protected perimeter is gone. I mean, it just doesn't it just doesn't exist. So you have the ability to have data at it, it really anywhere at any given time and it is anywhere at any given time and how you need to deal with how that data is going to be protected. And then to come back to the GDPR, not yeah. because I necessarily want to, but that's the perfect <laughs> example, right? I mean, where, where is your data stored? How is it controlled when it's stored there? How do you take in and protect data that's stored there, but belongs to a, you know, a, a, a different nationality, you know, is the data protection rules in the United States the same as they are in Germany or the UK or Australia or wherever? And, and the answer to all those questions is, is emphatically no. And so, um, you know, there, there's even been interesting court cases. Are, should, should a big multinational company um, be required to adhere to a warrant for information for data that is stored in a um, foreign subsidiary. So if I, my email is served in, um, you know, a, a, another country that's not the United States, is a United States warrant a, a valid consideration? And those questions aren't even marginally answered yet. Um, the reality of it is, is that some of those companies have chosen to basically say, no, we, we aren't going to adhere to that request because the the warrant did not in, uh, originate in the country where that data is reside, residing, and so are these big multinational companies? Are are they a law in and of themselves? Can they determine what laws are going to agree with? Uh, I'll give you another simple example. What happens when um, the U.S. taken subpoenas for the way that a, um, a a device is encrypted, and they choose to work with um, United States to take and decrypt that device. I'm talking about a real example here, right? Um, but then yeah. uh, another country um, on the other side of the world decides to subpoena the exact same thing, and that country says, "No, we're not going to give you that piece of information." Well, how does that work? You know, and then w- why why is it okay to get a subpoena from one country and adhere to it, and then not another country and not adhere to it? There, there's a whole set of weird regulations that have to be sorted out there. And like I said, if you think that these aren't real, turn on the news. I mean, th- these are things that are happening literally right in front of us. So no, I, I, um, I think you know. I think they're very real. And I, I think that doing things like training out, you know, using data to train an algorithm in, in a U.S. data center. And this is, I think, one of the problems that, you know, U.S. we're very U.S. centric. 
uh, you're clearly not. Um, you know, you're thinking about these global issues and data crossing international boundaries is, could cause all sorts of interesting problems and it's very fluid. So you could collect data in one locality uh, from an edge infrastructure perspective, but then send data, you know, send pictures back to be analyzed on Google's TensorFlow infrastructure and all of a sudden that transaction has now created GDP, GDPR or legal issues or some data analytics um, where you might have thought that everything was, you know, handled in a relatively local place. Yeah, I, I mean, say, I'll, I'll give you another real example that, that personally hit me. Things as simple as like my blog. Where is my blog hosted? Well, it's a Blogspot blog. I mean, there's no, there's no mystery there. But yeah. I got a notice from our friends at Google saying, hey, your blog is subject to GDPR requirements. You better be paying attention to this stuff. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? But by the very nature of the blog, if it even marginally thinks of touching a foreign citizen on, and the data that they might see or you might collect on them, now all of a sudden it becomes, you know, subject to GDPR requirements. And so you have to pay attention to that. Now, I, you know, I, I think I think I'm going to go put down my deposit uh, with Elon Musk to go start the lunar colony and, and have my data center on the, on, on the moon so I don't have to. Worry. Yeah. I mean, it, it literally, I mean, that sounds nuts, but that, I mean, that's literally what we're talking about at this point. I, where, where can I safely take and put something where I, I don't have to worry about whether, you know, my, my silly blog spot blog is, you know, going to be subject to these great multinational, you know, data protection regulations. And, and the answer is right now, I don't know where that is. I mean, if you can't just, you know, safely write about, you know, the latest cartoon episode of Star Wars, and you can't do it in your own blog. I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Uh, and so we've come a long way from the idea that I could walk down into the basement of my office building and touch a server um, into realizing that the data is already smeared across the planet. Um, and, and there's absolutely no comfort in knowing that there's that data is on a hard disk somewhere. It's just the opposite. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite of that. That's correct. Uh, with that comment, uh, Stephen, you want to outro us? Well, you've horrified us all, which is why I like <laughs> Oh, I, I, I have this image of, of a clown with a red balloon with GDPR on it. Well, now, being scarier than, than, than Stephen King, anything Stephen King wrote. Chris, I didn't even get to ask you, you know, I just want my self-driving car, and I know it's going to get hacked. I, I just only want to know. So just continue to tell me I can get a self-driving car and don't have to worry that it'll all be hacked. So um, I, I would love to be able to tell you that. And the only response that I have for you, my friend, is yeah. that um, never, ever, ever pay attention to what's going on at DEF CON or any of those conferences, because you will never, ever want to drive in a any kind of computerized car of any kind ever again. Well, that's why I'm going to go buy an old 70s Cadillac. <laughs> yes, you, you, you need a, a 1969 Delania. Pontiac GTO um, that literally runs on you know, any kind of fossil fuel that you can come up with and has zero electronic computer parts. <laughs> you can, you so, also should move to a place that, that we're very few with very low population density, someplace remote like Boise, Idaho or something. Well, yeah, Boise. go Boise. Well, it's because it's because I can't get to New Zealand, which I've been trying to for years. <laughs> they won't take me. So I still to Boise. Well, if I get to North Boise, they'll shoot me because they shoot everyone and they're crazy up there. But South, Boise, <laughs> South uh, Idaho is okay. Well, anyway, hey, Chris, where can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Um, you know, again, you're the security guru, so I'm sure some listeners might want to get some more information. Yeah, uh, of course, you can always um, find me on LinkedIn. Um, it, it's uh, the profile is under Chris Stefan. Um, the uh, company is Six Terra, C Y X T E R A, um, as we talked about before we even started. And then my personal blog it, that I was just making fun of is uh, thesecuritybeard.com. Um, there is a scarier than all get out image of me there, all matrix pixelized and such. Um, but, you know, and again, you can always follow me on Twitter too, uh, CloudSecChris. And um, don't is, fear the beard. Is and the don't bar. fear the beard. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> Friendly. Well, thanks. Thanks again for joining us. And certainly, I think we'll bring you back a couple months. And, uh, you know, so, no one ever really talks security enough. Everyone just goes, oh, whatever. And it's good to bring on a real security person to freak us out every once in a while. 
Yeah, always happy to do that. And I, and I, let me finish by saying too, is my, my goal has always been not to freak people out about security. I, <laughs> we're, I, as much as it, you know, we kind of talked about being freaked out. The reality mm -hmm. is, is that if you're freaked out about it, um, I, I don't want to freak you out about it. I want you to understand the, the better parts of the security stuff that you need to deal with and, and not be afraid of it. Um, you know, I think that the, this whole security through fear and intimidation is something that we've done for a long time. And I'm just not wild about it. And I think that taking yeah. and understanding security in general is the better way to go. And if you're afraid or you have questions, there's always guys like me that'd be happy to uh, probably make fun of you a little bit, but always take in and push you on the right path. But I think do something about it. Don't just say, oh, well, and ignore it. That's correct. Absolutely. That's correct. All right. Well, thanks again, uh, gentlemen, and we will all talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Stephen.